good all the time amen we want to welcome here to first christian church as always we're here because our savior jesus is alive he's risen from the dead and we're here to worship him and praise him with everything we've got so we're glad that you are here if you're a visitor please take a card in the pew in front of you fill it out put in that little box on your way out and we'd be glad to we'd like to know you better and welcome to you watching online i hope you can come and join us in person at your earliest opportunity but welcome to you also uh, I got a, a great thing to do. I did this last week, but I got another one to do. Uh, Joanne and Alan McConnell, if you'd come up, we have a little something for you. If you were here a couple weeks ago, uh, these folks placed their membership with us here at First Christian, and we are so happy about that. Of course, the Blevins did it last week when they were here, but they, they were out of town. And we just have this for you as a little gift, and we are so glad. Thank you that you are here. We are so happy that God led you to us. So part of the uh, part of the reason why we joined is because you got so many people and those of you who did it, I'm saying right now, who welcomed us even when we were strangers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We moved into the area last September and we're mm -hmm. new people. And we glad to be in church where people are welcoming. Well amen. And mm -hmm. here's the word. Oh. <laughs> And before we get into our worship time, Ken asked me to announce that any ladies that you took food the other day to the Pope's house, your dishes are in the kitchen if you want to pick no, them up. On the table out. Never, see, I knew I'd mess it up. <laughs> where, where are they? On the table here in the foyer. They're on the table in the foyer. So. But there are some in the kitchen still. Yeah. There's still some in the kitchen, so any dishes that are not collected today, well, I'm not going to take them because I don't cook, but <laughs> somebody's going to get them. Anyway, your dishes are ready to be picked up. So thank you, and thank you, ladies, for, for what you do. It's an awesome, incredible thing. So let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this beautiful morning. And I praise you, Lord, that you have given us the gift of yourself to us. And I, I, I love you, Lord, and we ask that you would be with us in our worship, that everything that happens would bring honor to Christ our King. And I, I thank you for this church family. The love that is shown every day amongst ourselves and to you is just an awesome thing. So we love you, Lord, and we praise things in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's the band. Well, good morning. morning. Sophie was telling me that we're, you know, we're back here behind this uh, the viewer there, and nobody can see us. So when we step out, it's like. Here is Charlie and Sophie, but actually it's, oh, it's them again. So anyway, <laughs> hey, let's all stand and sing. <laughs> Nobody famous. Blessed assurance. Oh, 
my fingers. Christians by our love. Come share us with us. Ten thousand reasons.
morning. morning. Call your attention to a very familiar verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 22 or 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance for me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he come. Whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup in an unworthy manner is guilty of sinning against the body of the blood. Let a man examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. Forever... For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ drink judgment on themselves. So Christians especially sometimes ask, why do we take communion? It's just something that happens when you participate. In fact, there are reasons for doing it. Once in a while, we need to remind ourselves, though, just how important this is. First and foremost, it's a matter of obedience. Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper and commanded all of his disciples to participate. participate. Not only is it a matter of obedience, but is a real sense a matter of sharing with Christ. Christ did not tell the disciples, you do it. Instead, he shared the meal with them, saying, set an example for us. In a real sense, we share the meal, even with him today. All the Christians in all places, all times, are one with us. We are the church. Maybe you've never thought about it this way, but communion is required a form of humility. If you take communion, you are implicitly confessing that you are a sinner in need of forgiveness. And if you're perfect and complete sinless, there is no sense in your communion. I don't believe there's anyone here today that is sinless. Done properly. This means that you find out that you need to change. You make a determination to change. After the ceremony is over, you implement the change which could be expensive. Sometimes things that we need to change cost us. You may have to lose a friend, and maybe you can gather him back as you become closer to Christ. You testify that you believe that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Son of the living God. You also testify that you believe that he forgives you and that you're a repentant sinner who comes to him. You testify that he will return to judge the living and the dead. We haven't seen this yet, but he said it, and we believe it. So as you take communion today, do it with integrity. I mean, what you're doing. Remember that you're doing it through obedience. To his command, in humility, as a testimony that he has forgiven you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day of life that you've given us to come back into your house of worship. Be with those of like precious faith. And now, together around your table, to share in this meal. We can partake with the bread that you've given us to represent your body that was broken on the cross. And for the cup, representing the shed blood that you gave so freely. That we could have redemption from our sin. In Christ we pray. Amen.
join me in prayer for the offering, please? Father, we thank you for all the blessings of life that you give to us. We just ask you to be with this as we take up these monies, and that the folks would be concerned of the giving be done with a right attitude, that our heart would be with it, and that you are the giver of all perfect gifts. We ask you to be with those that disperse these monies. Lead God, direct them in Christ when we pray. Amen. several 88 keys on that this morning, didn't you? <laughs> Good job, Eva, as always. I call your attention now to the prayer list that's in the bulletin. It continues to be pretty lengthy. And also I've had some additions that we need to add to that. Tom gave me a message that Judy Deal, which is Cammie McNeese's grand or mother, excuse me, mother, she's in the JCM you can see hospital with uh, health issues. Anyone else? Nobody? Okay, Kevin. Yeah. David, on, on behalf of Kenny and Heather and the whole public family, we would just really like to say thank you for your compassion, your support, and the way you reached out to the family in the time of Dick's passing. When, when, we put, when Kenny put that thing together, not having any family or anybody around, you, I didn't know if anybody would show up or not, you know, but they, you guys came out and, and really expressed yourself with love and honor and Tom <coughs> and knocked it out of the park once again. And, uh, but we really appreciate the food and, and everything that everybody done. And thank you for everything. Dick will be missed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Dave, if you guys would please pray for me on Thursday. I'm having a hysterectomy. Um, so just pray for no surprises, an easy recovery, and for the surgeons. Okay. Yeah. Certainly will. In what? David, I have a prayer and a praise. Um, I have a treatment on Tuesday, but tomorrow will be my one year anniversary that I started this cancer journey when I went to the ER for cause of blood clots. So I couldn't have gone through this journey without this church family and, of course, my my own family, right. and I've learned a lot. I'm pray I pray because I never missed a church service on the Sunday the stream, and the only way I got to it had to be through God because there were some Sundays I don't remember coming. I was in such pain, and the Lord brought me through it. And if you don't believe, talk to me, yeah. and I'll share it. Thank you. Someone else had their hand up somewhere, I thought. Way back here. Um, prayer request for Ronnie Ditch. Uh, he has COVID and 
Okay. Roseanne, did I see your hand? Okay. Okay. Yes, Heather. Um, my mom, Jennifer Ray, she's having a breathing test tomorrow. She's been having a lot of dizziness and just a lot of random stuff going on, so just pray for her. Any praises? <clears throat> oh, I've got praise. Um, Elizabeth had uh, her anatomy scan this week, and everything went well. So um, we're just getting more excited every day. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you again for this chance to be back together to now bring petitions for these that we've made recollection of because of sicknesses and those who have lost loved ones in the past few days and weeks. We ask your continued blessings on all those that are suffering through the continued issues with cancer or COVID, others farther that are having upcoming surgeries, we pray a special prayer for those. For those that are not able to be here with us today because of sicknesses or other issues, we pray a prayer for them also. We just ask you to intervene with these situations that we've made known of, and that even we may have forgotten, but you know that your healing hand will reach down and touch those that need your care. Pray now for Brother Tom as he brings to us the bread of life. We ask if there is one amongst our midst that needs to make a decision for you that this would be the hour and let us always rejoice because of the great gift that you've given to us. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Hang on. Good. Well, good morning again, everyone. I thought I saw Heidi come in and her mom. You, you are now referred to as Heidi's mom. That's all. But no. Hey, is Matt here? Okay. Oh, it's, huh? Not this time. Okay. Well, we're sort of glad to hear you or see you. Um, so, is Georgia with you? She is. Would you mind bringing her up? Is that okay? Or just what are there? She, there's Georgia. Oh, that's great. Yeah. It's good to see you. You know. Uh, The last month or so, the church family here, you know, we, we've had experience with death so many times. It just, you know, we, we lost Ronnie and Carl and, and Dick. And, and not only that, you know, Ron Prophet lost his cousin, had the funeral for him a couple weeks ago. And then, you know, Gene and Norman lost their niece this past week. And, uh, you know, and it, it, if, you, if you just, you know, if you, if you think about it, 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 it can get you down. Until you realize that these people, you know, the ones here in our church, they knew the Lord. And then when you hear something like Sandy just said, you know that God is still with us. And he's going to take care of us and he's going to get us through whatever life throws at us. You know, and, I, and along with that line, I want to, it's in the bulletin, but I want to make sure everybody realizes that Katrina, it's been about a year for her too. And she has a PET scan on March the 1st. And that PET scan is going to determine whether the chemo and the radiation did what it was supposed to do. And uh, hopefully and, and prayerfully ask you to pray that there's no cancer cells left. So, but anyway, God is good. Yeah. And he's good all the time. Amen. You know, this week we're, we're in Psalm 12. We're doing a series on Psalms. You know, last week we looked at Psalm number 3 and had enemies of life all around us and how God overcomes the enemies, whatever they may be. And, and today in Psalm 12, in our series, Psalms of the King, Psalm 12 talks a lot about liars. You know, so let's, let's talk, look at that. Let's pray first after we ring the bell. Lord, as always, I ask that you would speak through me. 
I ask you to guide my thoughts and my, my mouth and everything that comes out would bring honor to you, Lord. And I pray, Holy Spirit, you would move in people's lives. I just want to be your man, Lord. That's really all I want to be is your man. So you use me, speak through me in whatever way to bring you the largest amount of glory because you deserve it. And I love you. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Seems like people have always had a hard time telling the truth. Any, any amens there? Have you ever been lied to? Three of you. Okay. <clears throat> you know, and it's especially hard to tell the truth if, you, if it doesn't go with what you want. You know, your desires or something. You, know, you might cover up the truth or tell a, a little lie. You know, people... You know, even in our courtrooms, you know, ever since the beginning, we you know, have a hand on the Bible. I, you tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And we used to say, so help me God, at the end of that. I don't think they do that anymore. I don't know. Maybe in some courtrooms. But even on Perry Mason, they quit saying it. And that was back in the 50s and 60s. We have lie detectors. And people that are trained to use them where you hook somebody up to all these machines and to see if you're telling a lie or not. My brothers and I, we had, we had an own lie detector of our own. We had, we had a thing that if you were telling something, and one of the brothers, myself included, would say, is that honest to a Christian? Honest to a Christian. When you uttered that phrase, honest to a Christian, that was it. There, it was like, you know, double dog dare you. There was no further place to go. That was it. But the truth is still hard to determine. Sometimes we don't know whether people are lying or not. There's so many lies going around. What if we all had Pinocchio's nose? You know, every time there was a lie, you know, your nose would grow a little bit. I'm afraid, you know, a lot of people wouldn't be able to get in the door anymore. You know, we'd be bumping into each other and whacking each other. Okay. And we try to justify the truth or untruth by saying it's a little white lie. Just a little white lie. We make game shows out of it in our culture. How many of you remember Liar's Club? To tell the truth. Truth or consequences. And in days gone by, a man's word was his bond. If a man said something to you, that was it. Or a handshake. A handshake was the sealing of the deal. And nowadays, you know, we could have a 25-page contract that's full of loopholes that a you know, smart lawyer can get you out of whatever agreement you made, it seems like. Fact is, we live in an age of lies, deception, scams, spams, cheating, crookedness, cunning, deceit, dishonest, double dealing, fakery, fraud, and wiliness. We have it all. And you know what? According to Psalm number 12, it was that way 3,000 years ago. Because people don't change much, do they? So we're going to read Psalm 12 and we'll go from there. There's only eight verses in it. And here's what it says. Help, O Lord, for the godly are fast disappearing. The faithful have vanished from the earth. Neighbors lie to each other, speaking with flattering lips and deceitful hearts. May the Lord cut off their flat, flattering lips and silence their boastful tongues. They say, we will lie to our heart's content. Our lips are our own. Who can stop us? The Lord replies, I have seen violence done to the helpless, and I have heard the groans of the poor. Now I will rise up to rescue them as they have longed for me to do. The Lord's promises are pure, like silver refined in a furnace, purified seven times over. Therefore, Lord, we know you will protect the oppressed, preserving them forever from this lying generation. Even though the wicked strut about and evil is praised throughout the land. Does any of that sound familiar today? <coughs> My first point is it's actually a question. Do we live in an, have a society of an, un, un, in, an endangered species? I'll get it out in a minute. An endangered species. David said that the godly are fast disappearing, that liars are close by with their deceitful hearts. And we know lying still goes on today, don't we? It's a common occurrence, and even though we may expect it, we instinctively question any promise or commitment made to us. Don't we? Sometimes even by friends or brothers. The truth can be very fragile. There are so many ways to skirt the truth or plant the seeds of a lie without lying. 
For example, what if I came in here today, and I won't mention anybody, I'm, I'm using a name that nobody would maybe know it. But what if I said, it sure is good to see Fred sober today. <laughs> now what would you think about Fred from my statement? If you didn't know Fred, maybe you would think he was a drunk. Based on that statement alone, you may tell someone else, and it goes on from there. And before you know it, Fred is referred to the AA, and he's never took a drink in his life. That's what happens. Your statement was not a lie, but such it led to lying interpretation. We have to be careful about our mouth and what we say about people. Or how about this one? You're living in Amsterdam in 1943. The Nazi SS comes to your door and demands to know if you are hiding Jews in the house. And you are. What will you answer? The Bible is clear about how God feels about lying. In Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, it says this. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a man who stirs up dissension among brothers. Telling the truth is important. It is. God hates a lying tongue. It says so. And some would even argue in the hiding Jews illustration that telling the truth would be trusting God that he would deliver the Jews in some other way that's not seen. It's an age-old debate. The motive for telling a lie. Is it for selfish gain? Or is it for a higher calling? You know, you could go on and on. I studied this this week until my head was spinning. You know, how, is it okay to tell a lie sometimes, like to save somebody or to save an innocent person? Some people, even some Christian ministries say, no, you should never lie, never, under any circumstance. Well, you can save that for a debate around your kitchen table some morning, but if, if, if I were put in a position to lie to save the life of my family or any innocent person from the hands of an abuser or a terrorist, I'm going to lie to save them. I am. And I'm going to ask God to forgive me if it's a sin. But I think there's something else to consider here, and this is where I want to go with the rest of the message because this is an important thing. I think there's a connection between truth and grace. Truth and grace. Now let me tell you this. i got a picture coming up here about something I hate. I really hate these things. Ronnie, there it is. <laughs> I hate sea socks. I'm going to tell you why. I was a little shrimp of a kid. Okay? Ribs were sticking out. I looked like one of these poster kids from some starving nation or something. I was always the littlest one on the seesaw. And the big kid would get on the other side of the seesaw and get me up in the air and just keep me there. Ha ah, ha ha, look at Tommy. He can't get down. He's a little shrimp. And then when least expecting, they would jump off! And I'd come crashing down. Hate the seesaw. Hate it. But I think the seesaw has a lesson that is, life needs balance. Need fruit, we need vegetables. We need a gas pedal, we need a brake pedal. We need to work some, we need to play some. We need to give some, we need to take some. It's balance. And in our spiritual life, there must be balance also. I'm talking a balance between truth, which is vital, and grace, which is equally vital. In John 1, John tells us this, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So there's a balance here between grace and truth. What does that look like? Well, imagine a scale. You know, like weights on either side. On one side of the scale, you have truth. Let's say a Bible, and it's, it's there. 
and it's on the scale. And on the other side of the scale is grace, maybe represented by a gift, because gift of grace. You know, if one thing gets out of whack, it's not going to work very well. Remember, grace is unmerited favor from God. It's a gift that we don't deserve. With both on the scale, we have balance, equal amounts of truth and grace, and it looks pretty good. But what happens if one or the other is removed? What happens if grace is removed? What happens if truth is removed? It will cause all kinds of problems. The Bible says Jesus is full of grace and truth. <coughs> what happens if we're not? First of all, let's look at this. Let's see with what the world would look like with truth and no grace. <coughs> truth is important, but no grace. What would you look like? You would look harsh, legalistic, judgmental, unforgiving, and hopeless. Never to get it right. And the sad part is there are so many legalists, even in the Christian world, who study the Bible faithfully and can quote Scripture forward and backwards, but unfortunately use the knowledge they have to hammer people or try to hammer people into repentance. And it rarely works. Usually arguing with somebody about something usually makes them more immovable in their position, either right or wrong. Let me give you an example. There was a man here, and I heard this in my own ears. He spoke right here from this very pulpit, not one of the preachers we've had, but a guest speaker. This was way back 20-some years ago. He got up here and he started hammering just about everybody about some sin they might have in their life. Which is fine. If that's the truth, okay. But the problem is, the man had no grace whatsoever. In other words, he started listing people who he said were going to hell. And some of those people were people like Roman Catholics. Or if you smoked. Or did all these different things. If you did any of those things, you were going to hell. But he never offered help. He never offered grace. He never said, hey, if you smoke, I just, and I know you're, I believe you're going to hell, I, I'm going to have a program for you. I'm going to try to help you out of that. Never mentioned it. It was just harsh, legalistic. It, it, was, it was really terrible. In fact, I'll give you an example of how, the thing I'll never forget. His wife, this preacher's wife, had died the previous Thanksgiving. And this was about August of the next year. And he told a story about how every Sunday he would take communion to his wife, which is great. Need to do that. And he would give her communion and they'd pray. The Sunday before she died, the Sunday before she died, he went and took her communion. But she was comatose. Okay? Comatose. Not responding to anything. He took the bread and broke it up and opened her mouth and stuck it in there. And took the juice and put it in her mouth also. And he felt so good about himself because he said, I didn't want my wife to meet the Lord without having taken communion the last Sunday she was here. I thought to myself, are you nuts? Are you crazy? Can you imagine God, you know, if he hadn't done that? Gave the comatose woman communion she didn't even know she was taking? Can you imagine God that, that after she died saying, well, you know, Mary or whatever her name was, you know, you did pretty good. You, you were really fine. You were faithful and everything. But you know, that Sunday you were comatose and you didn't take communion. I'm sorry. You're out of here. Is that the God you know? But that's what happens when there's truth and no grace. Luke 11 says, Jesus replied, Are you experts in the law? Woe to you because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry. And you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. Danger is sometimes people use truth to bash others with something that's not really true at all. But it's opinion or tradition. How tragic is that? And we need to be careful about proclaiming truth but not extending grace. Matthew 7 for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now you can decide for yourself, but as for me, I need all the grace I can get. I do. I, can get, I need all of it. 
So I'm going to extend grace to others because that's how I want to be treated too. So what about the other way? What about grace with no truth? What if that's out of whack? Then you have liberal theology. Anything goes, no direction, humanistic teachings. Jude 1 tells it well. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immor immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. This is when we can really get in deep trouble with things like situational ethics and teaching that truth is relative and there's no absolute truth. People that are taught that what is true may be not true for you or for me and all that stuff. That's not going to work. They say just being sincere. Just be sincere. That's why so many Americans do not believe there's an absolute truth. Or that truth can even be trusted in every situation. They reject the truth of the Bible because it does not fit their lifestyle. So they extend grace. Do whatever you want. But don't tell me what to do. This permeates even in American churches today. The question is, was Jesus really God? Did he really rise from the dead? Surely other religions will get you to heaven if you're sincere about it. God really won't send anybody to hell, will he? It doesn't matter how you live. God will ultimately take you to heaven. So we see a rise in what we call happy church. Where everyone wins no matter how they live. You can be gay, or you can be living with your boyfriend or girlfriend outside of marriage. You can cheat, you can steal, you can lie, you can live any way you want and come to church and sing, Jesus loves me, and everything's going to be all right. Grace is free to all, no matter what you believe or how you live. Just go to a confession once a month and put in a good show, and off to heaven you will go. That's a trick of Satan. It does not work. Grace is much needed, but without truth to back it up, it's merely fluff. And there's a lot of fluff in the world today. 2 Peter 2 says, But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they have made up. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. Listen, Satan doesn't mind you extending grace as long as it's based on lies. This is what he does. He lies. He wants you to make you feel like you're okay when you're not okay. He wants us to reject everything God teaches and commands. John 8, 44, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he's a liar and the father of lies. And Satan never comes up with anything new. He's been doing the same thing since creation. Back in Genesis 3, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the tree of the, any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will sure, not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. What he was saying is, do what you want, Eve. It'll be okay. God doesn't have your best interest at heart. He just wants to rule you. You know, grace without truth is a cruel, cruel deception. Imagine, you know, we've talked a lot about cancer. Imagine you have cancer. And you go to the doctor. You don't know you have cancer yet, but you, you were getting checked out. And you go to the doctor. You know, he's a nice guy. He really is a nice guy. And he wants you to feel good. He doesn't want you to be upset. So he gives you the examination. He finds out you have cancer. But he doesn't want to upset you, so he tells you, you know, you're okay. You don't have any cancer at all. And you go, really? Wow, that's great. So you go home. A couple months later, you're getting sicker and sicker and sicker. 
and then find out it's so bad that you're dying of cancer. How would you feel about that doctor? Would you think, wow, I'm so glad he told me that I didn't have cancer because I would have really been upset. Would you write him a thank you note and rep recommend him to everybody else? No, of course you wouldn't. You'd be devastated that you were lied to and angry that he withheld the truth, wouldn't you? We need the truth and we need grace. What we need, is the last point, is we need truth plus grace. Remember, the Bible says that Jesus is full of grace and truth. We see this all through the Gospels. I think the best example was found in John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, we read this account. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was kept caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. We have the truth and grace here. The truth is this. The woman was guilty. She was guilty. And according to Leviticus and Deuteronomy, she deserved to die. Not necessarily by stoning, but some way she deserved to die. The man deserved to die too, according to Leviticus and Deuteronomy. But he's never mentioned. Remember, this was a trap. The truth was she was guilty. Grace was Jesus did not condemn her. He did not condone her sin either. It's very important. But he extended grace. Hopefully that woman was going to get her life straightened out. Can you imagine Jesus with all truth and no grace? If that would have been the case, he would have thrown the first stone. Since he alone qualified by his own standards. But he didn't. That's not the Jesus we know because we know he is full of truth and grace. That's how he could restore Peter after Peter denied him. Grace. That's how he could forgive the very people who were abusing and crucifying him. And that's how he can keep on loving you and me when we sin. I want to conclude by reading the last couple of verses again of Psalm 12 because it's full of grace. It's what it says. The Lord replies, I've seen violence done to the helpless. I've heard the groans of the poor. Now I will rise up to rescue them as they have longed for me to do. The Lord's promises are pure, like silver refined in a furnace, purified seven times over. Therefore, Lord, we know that you will protect the oppressed, preserving them forever from this lying generation. Even though the wicked strut about, and evil is praised throughout the land. Folks, we are saved strictly by the grace of God. The truth is we deserve to die. We deserve to go to hell. But thank God, he is full of truth, which we need, and grace, which we need. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please help us with this. Help us to tell the truth. And when we tell the truth, help us to tell it in love to people. Help us to extend grace to people who are struggling in sin, maybe in, in a lifestyle that's damaging or habits that are destroying them. Help us to be merciful as you have been to us. Father, if someone here today or listening needs to know your grace, has never accepted Christ, I pray this would be the day they do it. That they would believe in you and they would repent of their sins. 
they would confess you as Lord and Savior. They would be immersed in the watery grave of baptism and rise up and have the Holy Spirit with them and have the hope of an eternal home. Help us be your representatives here, Lord. May people see Jesus through us. We love you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing. If you have a need today, any kind, come on down.